Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I've uh, been looking forward to jumping back into our series, uh, going through the book of Colossians. The title of our series is Course Correction. Um, it's an examination of the 95 verses that make up Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. And so if you have your Bibles with you, let's take a look uh, together. It is one of those um, um, passages or those, those epistles that is so, so rich in content that we just kind of thought we're going to take our time going through this and let's kind of unpack it verse by verse. Um, just by way of quick background, because we haven't been here for uh, a few weeks, Paul is writing to a church uh, that is about five years old. Uh, a church that uh, was not planted by Paul, but planted by one of Paul's disciples, a guy by the name of Epaphras. Epaphras came to Christ through Paul's ministry uh, while he was doing some evangelistic crusades. And then he went back to his hometown of Colossae and planted a church. And this church is starting to grow. It's becoming effective. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, uh, it, they're seeing a wonderful thing happening in this five years. It is a mix of Jewish um, uh, c converts uh, to Christ, as well as Gentiles that had not known the God of the Old Testament. But in this mix of people that make up the church at Colossae, we've got people who are familiar with the God of the Old Testament and those who are completely foreign to the God of the Old Testament, all coming from different walks of life, different experiences, different backgrounds, kind of like us today. So there's a lot of what we see in the church of Colossae that we can see taking place in the church of Jesus Christ at large and also here at Integrity Church as well. The Jews who had been instructed by the law and awaited their Messiah find him in the person of Jesus Christ. And so for them, it was just kind of like they just crossed the line from Old Testament to New Testament. Seeing Christ as the fulfillment, the one they longed for, they find him in the person of Jesus Christ. The Gentiles, however, were a bit different. The Gentiles didn't have the experience and the teaching and the influence that the Jews had. These were a mix of people who, who came from various pagan backgrounds and various re pagan religions and people who took part of some really ungodly practices who had some crazy belief systems that were, into their, that were built into their foundation. They were completely ignorant to the God of the Bible, not he, hearing about the teachings of, of Moses and Abraham and, and the way in which God instructed his people. It was completely forward to them. But God the Holy Spirit drew them and brought them to this church and they, and they bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. And those who were completely foreign to the gospel come to faith in Jesus Christ and they're put into this mix of people. And they start growing and thriving in their faith and things are, things, things are going, way, go, going great. This was the demographic of the, of the church at Colossae. However, as they were continuing to grow, some creeps had crept into the church. You know creeps creep into the church? That's why the shepherd carries a rod and a staff. Right? He, he, he leads with a staff and he beats with a rod. Right? And so creeps had started to creep into the church. And they started to sow in uh, 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 false teaching. And they started to touch upon some of the teaching that the church, had, the church that had come out of those pagan practices. They started to mingle they were looking for like a buffet Christianity. A little of this, a little of that. Why can't it just be? And really, the, the, the main thing that they were stirring up controversy about had to do with the nature and deity of Jesus Christ. Is he really God of gods? Is he really the creator of all things? Is it in him that all things truly exist? Is it really that important? I may have heard people say, I'm into the whole God thing, just not into Jesus. Well, then you're just not into anything. You're into your own thing, right? Amen. He is the sum total of everything that we need. In him, we live and move and have our being. And so really everything centers on the person of Jesus Christ. And Paul is, is, is writing this letter to the church because Pastor Epaphras when hearing about what was going on in the church, wasn't having any of that, and he makes a beeline for the Apostle Paul. He's like, listen, man, here's what's going on in the church. Here's what they're teaching. Here's what they're holding on to. What do I do? He gets some instruction from his mentor, and Paul writes a letter. 
So we have in our hands right now this letter to the church at Colossians, a response to what was going on in the church, and he sends it back by the hand of Epaphras. We spent many weeks talking about the nature and and deity of Jesus that he talks about mainly in, 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 in uh, verses 15 through, through 22. He really highlights this, this immensely Christological passage of scripture. If you haven't weren't here for that, I'd encourage you to, to go back and, and check that out. But he begins to talk about um, his ministry, his heart towards the church, uh, and indeed his, the church at large. And it's kind of like there where we, we left off. We left off looking at verse 21 and 23. Let's just take a look there for a moment just so we can gather some, some context before we um, go forward. Colossians chapter 21. And you, he says, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. How many could say, that was me. I did that, right? Some of you might think, well, that wasn't me. He said, hostile in mind. <laughs> you know, I think sometimes if we would look at some of our motives, especially before coming to Christ, we'd realize that our universe really centered around us, which is ultimately hostility toward God. It's what got Satan kicked out of heaven, by the way. So God takes it pretty serious. And you who are once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. We see here that Paul was reminding them of what they were, and then he's celebrating with them who they are now in Jesus Christ. He's saying, that's where you were. You were alienated. You were, foreign to, you were foreigners. You were hostile to God. But God did not treat us the way we deserve, thank God. Right? That's, that's what mercy is. God not giving us what we deserve. Instead, God gives us grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. And he steps into our sinful situation. And he turns us around. And he, he reveals our need for a savior. And he gives us the ability to have faith in Jesus Christ. And he is, he is celebrating the fact that Jesus is able to take us from a, a crazy, sinful, godless place that we were and, and bring us, as he says in verse 22, to the point where he's able to present us to the Father. Isn't that incredible? the fact that God can take us in our worst possible state, apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our life, and then present us as holy and blameless and above reproach. That's a miracle, folks. That's a miracle. Why are we going to be able to sing around the throne for all of eternity? Because we're going to realize what we were and what God has done for us. And we're going to be able to do nothing else but sing his praise, at least for the first couple of million years. He gives us a clean slate. He gives us a fresh start. He gives us a new beginning. That's what Jesus provides for us. Paul said it's the hope of the gospel that they heard. And Paul says, and that's the, the gospel that I'm a minister of. And so it's there that we left off a few weeks back, and it's there that we're going to pick up today. Let's look together at verse, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to us, revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among you, among the Gentiles, are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of all glory. Okay, so the only thing that's harder to grasp with the, than, hard, the hardest thing to grasp here, other than the fact that this is the longest run-on sentence ever, 
You ever find that? Like when you're reading, you're thinking, did anybody run this through for grammar, or at least American grammar? This is like a really long run-on sentence here, but if we would kind of take a pause from it and, and look at the content of what Paul is saying here. This is one of those passages of Scripture that it would be very easy for us, because it's a run-on sentence, It'd be very easy for us to read through and then just kind of move on to the next thing without grasping the significance of what is being said. We want to kind of break it down a little bit. And I mean, just, just the first verse alone has words that I just don't like. It had words like, like suffering. Anybody like to suffer? Suffering, lacking. Words like affliction. I mean, those, those aren't words that you kind of throw out there to kind of get people to rally around your cause. But one thing that Paul knew a lot about was suffering. And not just from being on the receiving end of it, but Paul knew how to dish it out as well. Before he was, a, he was the great apostle Paul that we read about, Many of you may know he was a religious leader, a Pharisee, who went by the name of Saul of Tarsus. Saul made it his personal mission. His act of worship was to eliminate the earth of this Jesus community. To rid the earth of what he thought was this, this cult. This group of people who were turning the world upside down. It was Saul who was behind much of the, the persecution of the early church. It was Saul who was present at the stoning of the first Christian martyr, a, a disciple, a deacon by the name of Stephen. We read about him in Acts chapter 7. We see in Acts chapter 8 that, it, that Paul was, was there and, and affirmed, it was in agreement with the killing of Stephen for his faith. But then something happens in Acts chapter 9. This Pharisee Saul, on his way to Damascus to continue to persecute the church, has a Jesus moment. He is knocked to the ground, not his horse, but off his horse. So many people think he's knocked off his horse. There's no horse in there. How many thought, you won't raise your hand now, how many thought he got knocked off a horse? Right? That's in the same book that Eve ate an apple in, by the way, just as a side note. And so he just, here he is on his way to Damascus. He's on his way to go and persecute the church. And he has a come to Jesus moment where Jesus knocks him to the ground and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus. It's interesting here what Jesus says here. And this is something that we must embrace if you ever find yourself on the receiving end of persecution. If you ever find yourself on the receiving end of suffering because of your faith or because of, uh, of people not liking your Christianity. What did Jesus say to him? Why are you persecuting me? Me. You see, when, G when, when other people persecute you, you because of your faith in Jesus Christ, they're not persecuting you. They're persecuting him. Jesus takes it very, very personal. And Saul says, who are you, Lord? And obviously, you know the story. He, he bows the knee to Jesus. He comes to Jesus and he's taken under the wing of a disciple by the name of Ananias. And Ananias wasn't quick to embrace this new ministry opportunity that was put before him. I mean, when he first heard about it, he, he, kind, of, he kind of kicked and squirmed a little bit, not wanting to, 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 you know, he wanted to make sure the Lord knew what he was talking about. He just wanted to make sure the Lord hadn't, hadn't made a mistake. Because Ananias heard about this guy, Saul of Tarsus. He heard the story. And he kind of like, imagine you heard that one of the leaders of ISIS came to Christ. And they're like, hey, Mike, do me a favor. Take, take, take them under your wing here. And you're like, you sure you're hearing correctly? I've heard what this guy's capable of doing. And he's got permission to do it from the government. The Ananias is very much like you and I, just kind of like, are you sure, Lord? How many have asked that question? Are you sure, Lord? 
Isn't it great that God doesn't like, poof. <laughs> Next. <laughs> listen, listen to what Ananias says. You don't have to turn there. You can just write it down. Acts chapter 9, verse 13. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call upon your name. He's got permission. And the Lord said to him, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. That's a calling. I will show him how much he is to suffer for my name. It's just interesting how God takes the man who had been the cause of much of the suffering within the church and raises him up to be on the receiving end of that very same suffering. I think God has a bend for the iron, of the ironic. I think God always, there's a lot of irony that we see mixed in to the gospel messages. I mean, imagine that was what Jesus said to you when he called you. Barbara, I'm just going to show you how much you're going to have to suffer for my name. Want to join a team? <laughs> Larry, you're a chosen vessel of mine. And we're going to show everybody what it's like to suffer for my namesake. That's what he said to Paul. Well, at least he said to Ananias, but Paul obviously knew about it. How many would sign up for that? I mean, the reality of it is most of us would, would run to the opposite direction. Notice Paul's choice words in our text, though. He said, I rejoice in sufferings. That's what he said in Colossians chapter 1. I rejoice in sufferings. I rejoice. Now, I know that sounds like the kind of thing the Apostle Paul is supposed to say. But we need to remember that the Apostle Paul is no different than you and I. Paul felt like we feel. Paul knew pain like we knew pain. But Paul says, I, I rejoice. The synonym, I take delight in. I'm overjoyed. I'm exuberant. In sufferings. Look at the text. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm, will, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now, we're going to revisit in a moment why Paul will rejoice in his suffering. But let's take a moment and, and bring some, uh, a little bit of clarity to what appears to be a pretty confusing statement that Paul just made, that if that just went over your head, um, let's just take a moment and, and look back here, what he's just said. He said, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Does that bother anybody? As sometimes those are the kind of ones that we just move on and say, well, somebody will explain it to me someday. <laughs> well, today's your day. <laughs> I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. What in the world is Paul referring to here? Anytime I hear the word Jesus, I don't want to hear the word lack anywhere around it. Because Jesus doesn't lack anything. Is Paul suggesting in this text that, that the suffering that Christ endured for you and for me on the cross is still something that, that Paul needed to add to? That Paul needed to continue to endure what Christ lacked so that it would be sufficient? Of course not. What Christ endured on the cross for you and for me was all sufficient, all capable of saving us and paying the price for our sins. What this is saying is that the body of Christ, the church, will indeed suffer a certain amount. How much, we don't know. And what Paul is saying here is the more that I suffer, the less you'll have to suffer in the church of Colossae. That's things for Paul, I get that. 
But that was something Paul rejoiced about. Now, just hang with me here for a moment because, you see, the idea of suffering was, was not something that was foreign to these disciples. I mean, Jesus was very clear that they would undergo all kinds of suffering. He talked about the fact that you'd be handed over, that you'd be killed for my name's sake. He said, if the world hated me, they're going to hate you also. So we ought not to be surprised when people hate us because of our love for Jesus. It's not a matter of whether the church will suffer or the degree of suffering, but rather how the, church will, how the church will respond when suffering takes place. And to bring it home a little closer, how you and I will respond when suffering is given to us. Now there's two ways of looking at suffering. You can react to what's happening to you and that's oftentimes what takes place. Or you can allow God, the Holy Spirit, to show you what he's doing in you. Because I found that suffering has a way of revealing what's on the inside. I have found that the, when the pressure of life is introduced into my life, what comes out of the inside oftentimes is quite ugly, to be honest with you. You see, God in his wisdom allows suffering, he allows pressure to come into our life to expose things that are contrary to Jesus' character that exist in my life and yours. God allows suffering to come to his people, not because he gets his kicks out of seeing us suffer, but suffering has a way of producing godly character and, and brokenness in us. And you get enough of that stuff, you start looking like Jesus. There's no shortcuts to having the character of Christ developed in your life. I've never saw a godly Christian worth their weight in salt that hasn't been through storms, that hadn't been through times of suffering and difficulty times where they question, times that nobody had the answer for them. Have you been there? I mean, everybody had an answer for them, <laughs> but not the kind of answer they needed. Why does God allow that to take place? God will introduce inconveniences, difficulty, suffering, pressure into our life because he is committed to continue and complete the work that he began in us. Have you ever been real honest with yourself and realized how far you've got to go? Have anybody been as ashamed as I have in the, pa in the past, in the present, and thinking, you know, oh my goodness, I should be further than this. I shouldn't think like this. I shouldn't respond like this. Thank God nobody's able to read my mind. Before you get up and go, I can imagine you're probably very much like me. But God knows how to rid that from us. God knows how, see, God loves us so much. He doesn't do it to punish us. He does it to sanctify us. He does it because he's committed. Listen, here's the deal. You ready for this? This might free you up this morning. You are not your own workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. How encouraging is that? How wonderful is that to think that God of the universe would even take the time in somebody like me to reveal some stuff that gets in the way of me walking in the blessing of God. Because God doesn't really get much out of me coming into the kingdom, I don't think. I'm purely the benefactor. And yet, he does all the work. Suffering has a way of revealing what's on the inside. I've seen people, and so have you. People you may have worshipped alongside that were out there, they had their game face on on Sunday morning. Or like this, whatever your preference. <laughs> but went through times of difficulty, times of suffering, and things were introduced into their lives that they just ran in the other direction. And they didn't run to God, they ran from God. And you think, where are you going? Now, now's the time. 
But see, here's the deal. If we, if we were to take a tube of toothpaste and we were to put it out there on Route 101 and every tractor trailer from the north to the south would have run that thing over, the only thing that would come out of that is toothpaste because pressure only reveals what's on the inside. And the reality of it is there have been some that I've seen, they've gone through seasons of testing, seasons of suffering, hardship like everybody else, but what it revealed on the inside was a go mentality instead of a grow mentality. And I'm not talking about, I hope you realize, I'm not talking about leaving the church, I'm talking about leaving the faith. And yet I have seen others who hardship has been introduced into their life, suffering beyond their own capability, things that they would never wish on their worst enemy. And it has drawn them closer to Jesus. It has driven them to his feet. It has depleted them of all of their, their self, all, their, all of their pride, all of their accusation and answers that they've had for everybody else. Hardship has a way of humbling us and realizing maybe life isn't so easy for everybody else either. You see, and, and, and what, that, what that suffering will do, and maybe, maybe that's why I'm lingering on this a little bit this morning. Maybe that's where you're at today. And I know some of you are. I know some of you are really struggling right now with physical Ill- illnesses, things in your marriage that are beyond your ability to endure. Maybe your kids are just going through it and you just don't know what to do. Maybe you, maybe you just feel isolated and you think, nobody, nobody wants to be around me. Why, why do I feel like I just can't fit in anywhere? You see, there's some suffering that we experience because of us, right? Because we did stupid things. But then there's the other stuff that gets introduced that you think to yourself, I didn't, I didn't deserve that. That, that. That's the stuff. I mean, all of it, all of it has the, the ability to bring Christ-likeness into our life, but that stuff that, we, that, that came our way unsolicited becomes a tremendous tool in God's hands. And maybe you're here this morning, you're thinking, I am, man, if anybody knew that I'm at the end of my rope, I, I, I don't know what the next step is going to be. Maybe that's you this morning. I just want to encourage you. Allow God to work in you in this situation. Don't worry so much about getting out of the situation. Allow the Holy Spirit to do that work inside you in the midst of it. Because the season that came in in an unwelcomed way will leave as God does his work in us. Paul knew what it was to suffer. Jesus said, I will show him. He's a chosen vessel of mine and I will show him all of the things that he must endure for my name's sake. (laughs) Do you ever read about Paul's sufferings? He does a great job talking about in 2 Corinthians Corinthians chapter 4. He says here in verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. He says we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. You ever been there? I don't know what to do. Paul's been there. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. That's the key to suffering. That's the work that suffering accomplishes. Always carrying out the death of our own body so that the life of Jesus might come to the surface. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so that death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul knew what it was 
to endure hardship. Paul knew what it was to endure all kinds of things. And yet, he had the right perspective. I mean, we, we would all agree that, that when Paul finally changed teams, right, from, from Pharisee to apostle, he was quite a player. Paul was an effective leader in the church of Jesus Christ. Paul was a man who, 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 had, who was brought up into the third heavens and seen things so incredible he was put on restriction that not even, he wasn't even allowed to speak about it. He wrote three quarters of the New Testament, planted churches everywhere he went. What was he given? Not a trophy, but a thorn. Something to keep him humble. Something to keep him broken. Something to keep him dependent on God. Something to keep his feet on the ground. And I have found this in, 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 in reading about and getting to know every man of God and woman of God, they will all talk about something that God has introduced into their life that keeps their feet on the ground. For Paul, it was a thorn. And Paul, like every one of us, didn't want the thorn to be there. We read about that. Paul asked three times, Lord, take it away. I don't want this. Change my situation. I don't like this. But listen to the Lord's response, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. Do you want to walk in the power of God? Then you need to walk in weakness of yourself. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, he says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. And Paul says, for when I am weak, then am I strong. I will glory in my infirmities. Why? Because when I am weak, then I am strong. I want to encourage you this morning for that one that's enduring hardships beyond your comfort zone. Those, in, those difficulties that have been introduced into your life and, and it's going to be unique to every single person here. Sometimes God takes them away. Sometimes God lets you walk with a limp for the rest of your life to keep your feet on the ground and to remind you of your total dependence upon him. And we need to get to the point where we are, as Paul said, I'm content with my weaknesses. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Back to our text, I know I ventured a little bit. Paul says, I, I rejoice my sufferings for your sake. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for the ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints, period. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is, in Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of all glory. I like what Paul says here. He said, of which I became a minister. Doesn't that just reek of process? How many know that Paul wasn't just made the apostle Paul overnight on the road to Damascus? Paul said, I have learned in all things, he says in Philippians, to be content. And he said, by God's grace, I became a minister. Anybody frustrated with where you're not yet in Christ Jesus? Don't get discouraged. It is a process. And oftentimes, the process to getting you from where you are to where you want to be will include some suffering, will include some persecution, will inc include some hardship. But with those things comes God's grace to endure it. 
He says, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. I love that. What, an intru- what, a, what, a, what a tremendous insight into how Paul saw his ministry. He was aware that it wasn't something that was really his as much as it was something that was entrusted into his care. He was a steward. You know, when we hear that word steward, we oftentimes think, oh, oh, here we go. Here comes the money pitch. But the reality is that stewardship has to do with so much more than just money. It has everything to do with an owner that is not us, really. Certainly we're stewards of our finances, but we're also stewards of our families. I will give an account for how I treat my wife. I will give an account for how I raise my sons. I will give an account for how I lead my home. I am a steward, it is not mine. It is God's, it has been entrusted into my care. That's why we dedicate our children to the Lord like we did last week so beautifully. It is an awareness this is God's and we have been entrusted with this precious life for a season. Our jobs, we are stewards of our church, folks. This is so much more than an industrial building on Old Dock Road. This is holy ground that God has called you to, to be a steward of. To recognize it's God's and we have been entrusted with the responsibility to reach people for Jesus Christ, to glorify God in this place, to raise up young men and young women in the faith that will continue to champion the cause for Jesus, of Jesus Christ. We are stewards of our church. We are stewards of our time. We are stewards of our gifts. God has placed gifts into everybody's life, not so they just remain there dormant, but so that they would be used for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. We are stewards of our relationships. God brings people into our lives. And we must steward that. Paul saw his calling as something that he was to steward. And the very nature of being a steward means that at some point, You're going to give an account to the master, the owner, for how you were a steward of what has been entrusted into your care. Verse 25 gives us tremendous insight into what Paul knew was his ultimate ministry goal, his ultimate responsibility. He says, look at verse 25, to make the word of God fully known. That is the ultimate responsibility of every pastor or minister, as Paul talks about here. It's to make the word of God fully known. That's it. Paul knew that the greatest thing he could do for the church was to teach them the word of God so that they would know the God of the word. That's the truth I try to remind ministers of all the time. Our ultimate role is not to get people to embrace our political views, our pet peeves, our likes or dislikes. A minister's ultimate role to which he will give an account to God for is whether they are fully aware and whether they know the word of God. It is towards that end that a minister is called to reach the people in his congregation to bring the word of God. I'm going to talk more about the role of the minister next week as we look to close out the chapter, but let me just say, Paul isn't writing this letter to pastors, by the way. He's writing it to the church. And listen, what makes you a minister is not whether you get paid by the church. You and I are called, every one of us, are called to be ministers. Where you go to church or where you go, where you go, where do you go to, uh, for what office you go to is irrelevant as though it makes you a minister or not. Oh, that we would see that we have been called, each, each and every one of us, to the ministry. You know, when a church starts really firing all cylinders, when everybody starts seeing themselves as ministers, could you imagine what would take place around here? Could you imagine the lives that would be changed? Can you imagine the outreach that could take place? If everybody, if everybody, listen, if everybody approached the ministry 
with the same commitment that they approach their job? Oh, that's uncomfortable. But you know what? You can't make a distinction of that anywhere in the word. And you know what? The fruits of your job are not going to go as far as the eternal impact of your ministry. So really, where ought we to be putting all of our energy? Into the ministry of the kingdom of God. But look what Paul says here, and let's just wrap it up here. To make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. How cool is that? That we are the receiving end. The, the, the veil has been torn away. All of that which the prophets longed to see, all of that which the angels could not understand when it came to redemption, it has been revealed to us, his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, of this mystery, which is, it, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Incredible. God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of, his glo- of the glory of this mystery. And what is it? It is Christ in you, the hope of all glory. If there was one truth that I could put on your heart, something, if, if, there was, if I had the ability to get one truth so richly ingrained into your, into your head, it would be this, know who you are in Jesus Christ. Know what God has done for you and what he has made you. It is Christ in you, the hope of all glory. Because when we know who we are and we know whose we are, it changes everything. It is a game changer. It's a game changer. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word that challenges us and provokes us and reveals to us the fact that we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray for each person here this morning that is going through a trial. And I know everybody here could probably point to something they're going through, but there are some here that they're at the, you're at the end of your rope. You don't know which way to go. You don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. I just want to encourage you this morning and let you know that God loves you. And he's going to walk through this season with you. And as you remain close to him, his character is going to be revealed through you. And he'll do it in such a way that you'll look back and like Paul, you'll rejoice. You wouldn't trade it for anything. But hold on. When we're going through seasons like that, embrace God. Embrace his word and embrace the people of God, the fellowship of the one another. And so, Father, I just, I do pray for them this morning. Father, for those that have had long seasons of physical ailment, who've had the whisper of everybody else telling them what to do to no avail. Lord, I pray that you would bring great strength and encouragement today. Father, for marriages that are struggling today, that are at the brink of disaster, I pray, God, that you would minister in those times. Lord, that you draw each one closer to you. For our young people that are are in the scope of the enemy. Father, I pray that, Lord, you would just continue to infuse 
the young people in this church with great grace, great anointing, great power to rise up in this generation and to be a light in dark places. God, for our church, Lord, this church that you birthed for such a time as this, may you bring us further. Lord, may our hearts truly be broken for those who are broken. Lord, may you always keep our feet on the ground that Jesus would be the center of this place. Lord, may this be a hospital for those who are broken. And may this be a training ground for us to go out and reach the lost for Jesus Christ. That's our heart's desire. We thank you, we praise you, we lift you up. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.